Hey there, just a quick note. You may notice that Jeff and I don't discuss the recent passing of our friend Eileen Saki, who played Rosie on MASH. That's because Jeff and I recorded this episode the day before she passed away. We plan to pay tribute to Eileen in an upcoming episode. And now, on with the show. Attention, attention, all personnel. Incoming podcast. This is MASH Matters. Over and out. Hey, did you hear that, Jeff? That That's a new voice. Whoa, that was really cool. That voice that you just heard, that sounds a lot like the voice you heard on the show, MASH, which is, you know, what we talk about here on this podcast, MASH Matters. Yeah. And that's because our friend Sal Viscuso graciously agreed to re-record our open for the podcast. So here we are. This is a new era of MASH Matters, Jeff. It is. It's a new, it's a Viscuso era. The Viscuso <laughs> era, I think. That's what it is. Yes. We can call it that. Yes. Yeah. I like that. Yes. Mm-hmm. So thank you, thank you, thank you to Sal Viscuso, who, which, by the way, if you're, if this is the first time you've listened to MASH Matters, uh, you have some catching up to do <laughs> because we have a lot of past episodes which you can find on our website, mashmatters.com. Uh, but our last episode was an interview with uh, Sal Viscuso. And it was a lot of fun. Great guy. What a great guy. Swell guy guy and a terrific actor, by the way. Yes, absolutely. That too. So uh, we're going to do something uh, this episode that we haven't done in a while, which is answer questions and just go through listener emails and messages and voicemails and attempt. I guess I should say we're going to attempt to answer their questions. There are no guarantees here. No. (laughs) You do not get your money back if we do not effectively answer the question to your satisfaction. Absolutely not. Yeah. There are no refunds on this podcast. <laughs> I said this before, I know. We have so many listener emails and messages and voicemails and, and whatnot that's come in. And I love it. Yeah. We still want you to send in your emails mm-hmm. and don't stop. But um, yeah, it's a lot. Uh, we we might need to hire like a secretary or something. We might need to hire an entire staff to go ah. through these and help us with it, to answer them for us and then bring yes. us the answers and we can simply read the answers because so, otherwise, I, what yeah. are we going to do? That's I, true. I, I have very few answers. <laughs> <And> <laughs> let someone else bring them to me and I'll be happy to read them. And take credit for those answers. Absolutely. Absolutely. Without okay. doubt. Yeah, yeah. certainly. All right. So in order to uh, hire our staff, uh, you need to become a Patreon (laughs) VIP. And we'll tell you more about that a little bit later on. But first, we're going to start with our friend Carolyn. Carolyn is over in the UK. She says, uh, hi, Jeff and Ryan. In the UK, four episodes of MASH are shown on Freeview TV, a channel called Great TV, every weekday evening. This allows them to show a two-hour version of Goodbye, Farewell, and Amen every time it comes to the final season. Not perfect, but better than not seeing it. On special occasions, they show the full-length version about twice a year. I'm not sure if there's any way other European countries can access this channel, but it might be a way to watch this episode. Thanks for the extra Patreon episodes. Keep up the excellent podcast. Well, thank you, Carolyn, who is a Patreon VIP. Uh, This is in reference to, in one of our past episodes, somebody saying that they had not seen the uh, the finale Mm -hmm. because it's not broadcast. You know, MeTV here in the States will show it at least once a year, but you don't have regular opportunities. So that is our perspective from overseas. And then Jeff, there's another. Yes. Uh, Robert. Yeah. yeah. Robert says, hi, guys. I thought I'd check on that episode's availability in Norway. Oh, it is available on Disney Plus here. Well, there you go. But in their infinite wisdom, Disney seems to have not included it in the episode listing for the last season. <laughs> you have to search for it by the episode name to find it. Well, that's a lot of work. Come on. I mean, yeah, you got to search for something. Whoa. Anyway, please keep it up, guys. You're doing a great job. Thank you, Robert from Norway. You may have access to the final episode and not even realize it. So if you're overseas and you have Disney Plus or however you watch MASH, you might need to actually search for Goodbye, Farewell, and Amen in order to find the final episode. Or, or you can go to Norway and now you know how to get it. <laughs> 
<laughs> when you're there. Yeah, just go to Norway and Robert can help you with that. Go, go can... to Robert's house. We'll provide you with the address and phone number <laughs> as soon as at the end of this podcast. <laughs> so let's move on here. Joe says, hi, Jeff and Ryan. Uh, thanks for the great podcast. My question was the number 4077 chosen for any particular reason. Hmm. Well, I did not find a definitive answer, but there was a post on Reddit that asked a similar question. Somebody there answered, they say it was based on the real life unit MASH 8055th. So I think the author wanted to stick with that pattern. Maybe Hornberger, who was the author of the book, wanted to make sure that the 4077th isn't a real MASH unit. MASH units were designated with 8,000 numbers because they were part of the 8th Army. Near the end of the Korean War, the designations were changed to 40 numbers. So the 8055th MASH became the 43rd MASH, and the 8063rd MASH became the 44th MASH. And I am terrible with math, so I don't know if any of that made sense. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea what anybody's talking about, really. I'm so confused. <laughs> huh. Wow. But I think what they're going what what they were saying is there was no way for there to actually be a four oh seven seventh because mm-hmm. those numbers would not have been used in the Korean War. So that's it. Like I said, we weren't going to promise that we will have accurate answers. <laughs> This is all speculation, folks. If you haven't figured that out by now, after 103 episodes, then I I don't know what else to tell you. (laughs) We guarantee nothing is absolute here. (laughs) And Mark says, (laughs) Greetings, Jeff and Ryan. Love the podcast. I've listened to every episode. Well, very cool, Mark. Thank you. I started watching MASH while in high school during the late 70s and never missed an episode. My senior year at Ohio University, my roommates and I watched the series finale on a small black and white TV. It wasn't until 2018 that I watched the finale in color via YouTube. My goodness. 2008. You couldn't. Wow. Then that's something. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, anyway, I'll stop saying wow. Jeff, you are in (laughs) one of my favorite scenes with Frank Burns, BJ, and Hawkeye sitting in the mess tent. There is a bowl of tapioca pudding on the table in front of you. Frank grabs the pudding, shoves a spoonful of the pudding in his mouth and says, hmm, raisins. You reply, no, sir, flies. Ah, I love that. I remember that scene. That was pretty funny. It almost made me laugh when I said it. It was funny. Also, Jeff, in the episode For Want of a Boot, Hawkeye hitches a ride on a gurney because of the giant hole in his boot. Is that Jeff Maxwell pushing that gurney? Keep up the good work, gentlemen. Well, thank you. Uh, I don't know (laughs) if that was Jeff Maxwell (laughs) pushing the gurney. I don't know. I can't tell you. I don't remember. Jeff, let me take this one. Okay, go ahead. Yes, that is Jeff Maxwell pushing the gurney. (gasps) Whoa, what was he yeah. doing pushing that? We was is that it really was, huh? I mean, you've seen the actual Jeff Maxwell pushing. Yes. Huh. There you go. Well, there what a show. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm already exhausted from answering all these questions. I, I don't know about you, Jeff. Too. Well, I'm my, I'm laying prone whoo, now oh. that I do this. Also, the for want of a boot, that episode also notable for the guest star Michael Lerner and uh, he just passed away. Uh, you know, I think he was most famous probably for his role in Barton Fink. And also he was in the movie Elf. He was the publisher who demands that uh, James Kahn work on Christmas Eve to pitch the ideas. So he played Futterman, the dentist, in that episode, and he just passed away. So our condolences to his loved ones. Indeed. All right. Daniel. Daniel Daniel. says, hey, Jeff and Ryan, MASH has long been my favorite show. And while I thought I knew a decent bit of trivia, your knowledge has blown me away, Ryan. (laughs) (laughs) You're welcome, Daniel. I bet you feel differently after listening to this episode so far. (laughs) And Jeff, Igor has always been one of my favorite characters. But after hearing your explanation of your take on the character, I love him even more. Oh, Daniel, thank you very much. You want to go square dancing sometime? (laughs) Come on, let's go. Daniel says, I'm 24, so I've only ever experienced the show on DVDs and in syndication. So like you, Ryan, I didn't get to watch the show all the way through in order. When my mom first introduced the show to me, I never really cared for it. Ah, that sounds familiar. But once I was old enough to understand and appreciate it, it quickly became my favorite show because of its perfect mix of comedy and drama and because of the intelligent humor. My question is... 
if Gary Berghoff's contract ran through seven seasons, why did he make five episodes into season eight before leaving the show? Hmm. Thank you for a wonderful podcast. Thank you, Daniel, for your wonderful message. We appreciate it. Daniel, thank you for saying that about me and Igor. I, I really appreciate it. I made a silly comment, but I really appreciate what you said. And if you want to go square dancing, we can. I just It's up to you. <laughs> Have your people call his people. Yeah. So there are some different ideas about this, but the one that kind of stood out to me was the fact that the Goodbye Radar episodes were really intended to be at the end of season seven. But the story goes is that producers were able to convince Gary to return for the beginning of season eight. And in some of those season eight episodes, the credits are different. At the very end, it would say also starring Gary Berghoff as Radar. That was for those first like six episodes of season eight. And then the first three episodes of season eight, he's not even in those episodes, but they explain it that he was away on R and R in Tokyo. And in two of those episodes, Gary makes like a little cameo appearance. He would be talking on the phone from his hotel room in Tokyo or something like that. So it sounds to me, the story that I'm, uh, that I'm kind of getting is that producers were able to convince Gary to hang around just a little bit longer for the beginning of season eight, just for a few episodes so they could use Goodbye Radar in season eight instead of ending season seven with it. Could very well be. I don't know. Or that could be completely wrong. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, it sounds reasonable. Yeah. You know, usually when these kinds of things happen, it's a show busy sort of situation. There are people involved and Gary wanted to leave. And the uh, problems that that all brought up and the confusion and the concerns that that would have caused within the structure of the producers and everybody, I'm sure had some bearing on what we saw mm -hmm. and Gary's own feelings of his own life and what he needed for himself as a human being rather than as an actor. Uh, those are all very, very important to him as well. So all that, you know, comes to blows and they try and negotiate <laughs> some way to work everybody's agenda out as yeah. best they can. And then there's a business and there are contracts and there's agents and there's money <laughs> involved. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's complicated, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah. It's complicated. And it's just, it's a personal issue. It's a human issue. It's a business issue. It's a show business issue. It's an artistic issue. All that stuff goes into those things, and boy, I got a headache just thinking about it. <laughs> are you are you suggesting that actors have issues? <laughs> no, well, I, let's move on. And Sue says, thank you. So happy, Jeff, that taking a step of faith into the podcast world, you are getting to hear how much your work has meant to people. How rewarding to find out what a blessing you have been. Oh, God, wait a minute. I'll read that again. How rewarding to find out what a blessing you have been. Thank you, Ryan, for dragging him into this. <laughs> oh, gosh. Kicking and or screaming. Yes. You know, Ryan dragged me into this because I stuck my foot in his mouth. <laughs> he couldn't get it out. No. I'm not sure no, that was I the am way it thrilled worked. that you came along. Can you imagine how bad this would be if it was just me trying to answer these questions? I mean, come on. <laughs> Good Lord. Nobody wants to listen to that. <laughs> Well, thank uh, you, Ryan, for dragging me into this. <laughs> and thank you for being dragged. Yeah, all right. All right. Les has a very short question. He says, I would love to hear Jeff tell us his Steve Jobs story. <laughs> my Steve Jobs. Yeah, Jeff, my... <laughs> do you have a Steve Jobs story? I do have a Steve Jobs story. It has nothing to do with Mag. I know, don't care. Dude? We want to oh, hear it. Oh, my gosh. Oh, wow. Yeah. Steve Jobs. Okay. I'll go through this. I, many years ago, bought a big, fancy Apple computer. At the time, it was the Tower. It was a G5. It was the most powerful, most incredible computer on the face of the planet. And I did it because I wanted to do some video editing, and this thing had enough power to do that. So I did a lot of research. It was about $2,500, bucks, 3000 dollars something like that, and I bought it. And I got it home, and I set it all up, and in about three weeks, it stopped working. <laughs> and I said, gee, this isn't right. And so, you know, they, all these things come with a guarantee and Apple gives you, I don't know, 90 days or a year or whatever it is, and they'll fix it free. So I call them up and I say, hey, Apple, this $3,000 computer doesn't work right. 
Well, bring it on into the store. Let's see what you wait. We can do. Let's point out that this is not recent, right? This is no, this no. Is years ago. This is before Apple was truly Apple. What it is now, right? It was beginning to become Apple. You know, it was pre iPhone. It was pre iPhone, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah pre iPhone. Yeah. Yes. They said, well, bring it in. And I, and actually I said, well, it's really heavy. You know, can you tell me what we can do? And, and they asked me a few questions and I had added another hard drive into the computer. So it came with a hard drive and I added another one in it because video editing takes up so much storage. I wanted enough storage to be able to do that. So I added another separate non-Apple purchased hard drive. So when I explained this to Apple over the phone, he went, ha, 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 too bad, buddy. You can't do that. That destroys the warranty. So you're out of luck. And I said, well, but, 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 but it's $3,000. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and they said, oh, no, that ain't going to happen. Yeah, no, we're, we're not even going to fix it. No, we're not even going to take this stupid hard drive out. We're, we're done here, pal. I'm sorry. You've got a big, uh, big weight you can use on your desk. <laughs> so I was very depressed. <laughs> and so I went into the Apple store in about a week after that. And I was in there on a mission to try and talk with them and, and reason with them and say, please help me. You know, what What can we work out here? This is a lot of money. I, gee whiz. And, you know, I didn't do anything purposely to destroy the machine, but the, the machine is not working. So maybe you guys can help me fix it. Okay. So I go into the Apple store. It's very early about, I don't know, they just opened at probably 930 in the morning. And I walk through the store and in the middle of the store, there were three guys standing there and the, the place was really pretty empty because it was so early. And I kind of get closer to the three guys and I look at them and one of them looked exactly like Steve Jobs. <laughs> and I'm looking and looking and I'm thinking, well, it can't be Steve Jobs. not going to be in a store here. So I get closer because I, there wasn't anybody else to go talk to. So I was going over there and talk to one of the sales guys say, Hey, so I got up next to these three guys and I look at this man and it's Steve Jobs Wow! <laughs> standing in the Apple store. And I went, wow. And I, they all kind of looked at me like, what are you doing here? And I said, Ex excuse me, I don't mean to interrupt, but are you Steve Jobs? And he said, yes, I'm Steve Jobs. I went, really? <laughs> <laughs> and I stuck out my hand. He shook my hand. And I said, well, Mr. Jobs, I've given your company a lot of money. And he <laughs> smiled. And he said, well, thank you very much. Don't stop doing that. I said, oh, oh, oh okay. Uh, and so we chatted a little about something for a minute. And the, the conversation became very quiet. And I said, excuse me, Mr. Jobs, can I tell you a story? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, wow. <laughs> and he said, yeah, go ahead. And I explained my predicament. And he's listening to me and he's listening and nodding his head. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he pulls out a pen and he writes down a telephone number on a piece of paper. And he said, Jeff, uh, <laughs> we're, we're, we were, uh, you know, best buds by that point. Right. <laughs> on, first name first basis. Name basis. <laughs> you said, yes, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> he said, call this number. Tomorrow morning, they'll be expecting your call. <laughs> and I went, oh, okay, Mr. John, <laughs> I'll, I'll do that. <laughs> and I kind of walked out. I said, again, it's so such you know a, a fun thing to meet you. Oh, well, it's nice meeting you. Thank you. And keep buying our product. Yeah, okay, bye-bye. <laughs> so I left the store kind of on cloud nine. I mean, I'd never met a billionaire like Steve John. Yeah. I can't wait for the next morning. You know, <laughs> I think I was up all <laughs> night long. So I wake up, I get the paper out, I call the number, and I, oh, I see, ask for John. Okay. So the, hello, Apple, blah, blah, blah. hi, I'm calling John. Just a minute. So then I go, hello, this is John. John, uh, my name is Jeff Maxwell. And I, he said, oh, no, no, thanks for calling, Jeff. Uh, Steve told me to uh, expect your call. Really? <laughs> he did? <laughs> Uh, yeah, what's going to happen, Jeff? We're going to send you a brand new computer with two hard drives in it. And when you get it, take it out of the box, put that old one in the box and send it back to us. We'll provide you with all the postage and everything. And uh, Mr. Jobs wants to thank you for being a really good customer and hopes you appreciate this. Ah. And I said, I really appreciate this. <laughs> And that was, that's my Steve Jobs story. Wow. It really happened. It was an amazing thing to me. I, I just, I couldn't believe it happened like that. And 
But he was respectful enough of his product and my story to understand that what I said had value to it. And he didn't want some customer to walk away being shut out by, you know, the the company, which they sort of did to me pretty cruelly. Yeah. But he, he reversed it in a heartbeat. And honestly, he's the only person on the planet who could have done that. Right? Absolutely. I mean, because they had already said, you're out of luck. They said, goodbye, pal. We're really sorry. Yeah. He is the only person who could have done that. And he was, <laughs> oh, man. And he did it. Yeah. And it's interesting. I, I kept that computer, and I think that was from 2006. Hmm. <laughs> uh, and I kept it. I used it. It was a really good, it turned out to be a really terrific machine. And I, I used it and used it and used it, and it lasted, and it was still going. But literally two weeks ago, I took it into that same Apple store to turn it in. <laughs> you know, they recycle them or do whatever. They turn it yeah, into bird yeah. seed or something, right. plastic part. I don't know what they do with them. But I turned that, you know, that computer into them so that they could, you know, recycle it and make something new out of it. So really kind of an interesting moment. That's my Steve Jobs story. Well, if you were moved by that story, uh, would you consider supporting MASH Matters on Patreon? Just go to mashmatters.com slash support. And uh, for as little as $3 a month, you too can continue these captivating stories. <laughs> Let's say hello to a few of our VIPs, including Private George's Mom 2021. <laughs> <laughs> See, when you sign up, you just put whatever name you want there, and that's what we're going to read. So thank you, Private George's Mom 2021. And Private Brian Powell. Corporal Jason Messick. Corporal Lisa Neville. Captain Jonathan Watson. Captain Matt McDonald. Major Mary Lovato. And Major Paul Lawrence. Thank you for supporting the show. Again, mashmatters.com slash support. All right, let's go to the phones. What do you say? Here is a voicemail from Brady. Hey, Jeff and Ryan. This is Brady Palmer from Lebanon, Tennessee. Wanted to say thank you so much for a great podcast. It's allowed me to become a student of the show and uh, to research and learn things about it I would have never thought. And the show business aspect has been amazing. But my question goes back to the table read. And I'm just curious, as I listen to the table read, it was so polished, and I know that the actors are professionals, and they've invested their lives at that point into those characters, and they have become those characters, but it was so polished that I thought all you needed was a Foley artist, and it would have been as though I was just in the room and Bash was on in the background. It sounded so well done, just off the very first table read. So, Jeff, my question for you is, are the table reads always that well polished and go that smoothly? Because it seemed like it stayed right exactly to the time that the episode would have uh, been allotted to run during its time slot on the air. So thank you again so much for the podcast. Love listening to you guys. Love laughing every day on my way back and forth to work. And uh, wish you all much more success and look forward to hearing many more podcasts. Thank you. Well. All right, Brady. Do they all go as smoothly as the one that we had? Um, You know, yeah, they do. Hmm. And uh, they do kind of because uh, everybody usually gets the script before they sit down to that table. So you kind of understand what's going on in the the show and the episode. You formed your little ideas of how you're going to do something or not. And so when you sit down, you're, you're kind of ready. After a while, it becomes something you look forward to because you're going to discover certain things during the table read and hear stuff and hear other people, what they're doing. And you're going to laugh and have a good time and people are going to act silly and say very smart things sometimes. So they pretty much do go very smoothly. There can be lots of interruptions by virtue of people laughing (laughs) <laughs> and, and that's really good. And, you know, the more laughing there is kind of the, the more fun they're all having. And if there is a, uh, a contentiousness about somebody having a problem with a line or something, the writers are so able to uh, make that go away as quickly as possible by saying, hey, we'll look at that. Hey, we'll change that. Hey, yeah, we agree with it. But because MASH was written so well, it rarely happened. There certainly were discussions that were brought up by virtue of the, you know, somebody really disagreeing with some way or direction the character was going, but it was very, very rare. Do they all go as smoothly? 
Probably not all of them, but pretty darn close. Well, and these actors have been doing those characters, too, for so long that, you know, yes. they were very comfortable in those characters' shoes. Yeah, exactly. And uh, if you have not yet listened to the uh, Table Read episode, uh, it's something really special. That was episode 56, and you can find that at mashmatters.com or on your favorite podcast player. It's a really special thing to get to listen to, and then uh, having uh, our friend Dan Wilcox on there as well to uh, give us a little insight into that episode. Yeah. Fascinating stuff, yeah. It's about as behind the scenes as you can get. If you like behind the scenes yeah. stuff, boy, listen yeah. to that, and you're going to hear as much as you can stand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Michael says, thank you for your many contributions to the legacy and legend that is MASH. I'm hoping you can address how the episode, The Billfold Syndrome, came to be called that. It is one of the most compelling episodes in my experience as it deals with a medic's experience of losing his brother in battle and how such a tragedy affects him. Can either of you shed any light? Well, um... I cannot. <laughs> uh, I'll just be, I'm, I'm really sorry to say specifically, I wish I could just off the top of my head, impress everybody. Yeah. But unfortunately today, the head is not going to do that. So let's see if Ryan can impress us all. Well, I found a little blurb on Ken Levine's blog mm. because he and David wrote this particular episode. And he says, this is from his blog. It says, the title Billfold Syndrome is a psychiatric expression. Someone looks at his ID or Billfold and can't place himself. This story came right out of research. Larry Gelbart, Gene Reynolds, Burt Metcalf, and then later me and David interviewed doctors, nurses, corpsmen, soldiers, anyone who served in Korea. Most of the stories done on MASH were inspired from these interviews. David and I got together with a prominent Beverly Hills psychiatrist I knew, and he walked us through the hypnosis process step by step. We used some of the doctor's lines verbatim. This is the episode where uh, Sydney hypnotizes this young soldier who has lost his memory. He didn't know who he was, and uh, he's able to bring out some really rather painful memories of losing his brother in the war, but it also helped him to regain his memory of who he was. So that is where the title, The Billfold Syndrome, comes from. Interesting. So, there you go, Michael. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was an actual answer. Yeah. Well, thanks, Ken Levine, for, yeah. <laughs> for providing exactly. us with an actual answer. Yes. Whoa. Thank you, Ken. <laughs> Do you have the number of that Beverly Hills psychiatrist just, just in case we need one? Okay. Never mind. I'm sorry. You're feeling very sleepy. Your eyes are getting heavy. <laughs> All right. Walter says, hi, Ryan and Jeff. My main reason for writing is to bring attention to an old film which predates Richard Hooker's 1968 novel about a mash hospital. 1953's Battle Circus, starring the great Humphrey Bogart and June Allison. It is set in the Korean War with the mash 8666. It is a movie not talked much about, mainly because it isn't the best, but it does attempt to depict the hard-nosed and hard-drinking hijinks of an army medical unit during that war, although not nearly as successful as the 1970 MASH movie or the TV show, which we love to discuss. Thanks for the engaging entertainment of MASH Matters. Keep up the good work. Well, thank you, Walter. I had never seen this movie. Did you know about this film? I do not know about this film. I'd like to see it. I'm intrigued by it. Yeah. It's set in Korea during the Korean War. This was the only time Bogart ever did a film for MGM. He plays a surgeon and a commander of the MASH 8666, which is, I guess, in the movie is shortened to 66 in the dialogue. And June Allison was a newly uh, arrived nurse. And they have a love story. Despite... The obstacles, their love flourishes against the background of war, enemy attacks, death, and injury. Mm. But as Walter said, it may not be the best thing you've ever seen, but it mm -hmm. does sound kind of interesting. And you can find it on Amazon Prime. I know Apple TV, you can rent it on there. Anywhere else, I don't know. Again, that movie is called Battle Circus. Battle Circus, yeah. Wow. Not to be confused with Battle of the Network Stars or Circus of the Stars. Those are two completely <laughs> different things. Just want to clear that up. Yeah, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go see. I'm gonna watch that. By golly, I await your review. All right. And Brody says, "Question for the gurus: In the episode of Moose and Men, Frank is on the hunt for enemy bombs buried near the unit. His bomb squad includes a private wearing a football helmet, maroon shoulder pad, and a catcher's chest protector. Was that private actually Igor?" It just makes sense that someone experienced in latrine digging would help dig up a bomb and or a kimchi pot. Hmm. 
Hmm. Well, he said question for the guru, so can you get them on the line? And uh, Let me just can... call, call okay, the good, gurus. Good. Wait a minute. Hang on. I got to call the operator. For... Uh, Mildred, could you come in here for a minute, please? <laughs> I don't know where she is. Oh, I looked at this. Yeah. Uh, I went back and reviewed the episode. Mm-hmm. I think it is you. Yeah. Do you have any experience of wearing a football helmet, maroon shoulder pad, and catcher's chest protector in a scene with Frank? You know, I do here on the weekends, but I don't know that I remember doing it in the <laughs> show i don't remember that right. sorry i should have specifically said on the show my apologies. you know you have a few martinis on the weekend you gotta do something <laughs> to protect your environment hey whatever you do in the privacy of your own home uh, mm-hmm. is up to you yeah it's hard to tell because you have to look through the football helmet and you can't see clearly who it is but I believe it is you. I have a theory. Now, I don't remember doing that, but I don't don't remember doing a lot of stuff. I remember the Steve Jobs story, but I don't remember very much else. Uh, (laughs) I don't think it would be me because I don't think I would have let myself be covered up that much. (laughs) Uh, I doubt that I would have gone. Now, here's there is a guy. There was a fellow that worked on the show named Carmine Skelza. Hmm. Carmine Skelza and I, if you were 20 feet back, you might have a have trouble, you know, or you might see there's a similarity between the two of us. Uh, up close, they're not much, but if you were 20 feet back and it was foggy out <laughs> and one of us had a catcher's mask on, you might mistake uh, him hmm. for me. Okay. So I, I don't think it was me. I think it was Carmine Skelza. I mean, if it if it looks like me, it does look like you. It That's does. the thing okay. is, it does look like yeah. you, but you can't get a great look. But yeah. what I could see did look like you. So put it out there to the listeners. If you watch that episode where they're digging up the kimchi pot, look and see if you think <laughs> that's Chet. Let's let's just you know take their temperature and see if uh, other Mash fans out there think it's you or not. And I promise I will look at the episode as well and see if I can remember something that I don't remember now. All right, it's a good show. You really should watch it. I really should. Um, so many people love it. I just got <laughs> God, I got a binge watch or something like that. I don't know. All right, let's go back to the phone lines. This is from Robin. Hi, guys. My name's Robin. I'm calling from Florida. And before my question, which I think is a decent one, uh, I, have, I do want to thank you both from the bottom of my heart. I'm dealing with living with a mother with dementia and... One of the things, like so many people, one of the things my family really did a lot of was watching Nash together. I'm 47, so I didn't watch all of it live in real time. It was already in syndication by the time I was aware of it. But we did watch the later seasons live. And I do have relatively vague memories of the finale. And I was thrilled years later to catch it one time as a syndication broadcast. I wore that video cassette out so many times. Oh my goodness. But the reason I mentioned mom is that her mind is starting to go and we don't get along on a whole lot of things, but I'm basically her caregiver. And one of the things we can do is we can sit and watch MASH together for two, three hours sometimes. But it's absolutely wonderful to have that again. And I'll tell you, she can't necessarily follow the plot anymore, but she remembers the characters because you were our family. Anyway, the question, though, I was telling her about the camp being actually in the state park. And we got to talking about how sometimes they're on a set and sometimes they're in the park. And we realized how often the guys would walk across the campus or campus walk across the camp oh my god i can't leave a message to save my life but they'd walk across the camp and come back again and just brief interstitial scenes i guess is what they would be and i'm curious as to how they filmed that so my question is how did they break down the filming schedule did you do a week's worth of stuff on site at the camp and that was maybe two episodes worth of outside scenes and then go do those same two episodes, the inside scenes on set. Was it three days a week you were out and two days a week you were on? Obviously every episode was a little different, but I'm curious, how did they make that work? There's no way they did the scenes in order. That wouldn't work at all. Anyway, thanks again, guys. 
and I will not at all be sad if all you do is answer the question and don't play the message because this was a hot mess. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, thank you, Robin. Uh, Before we get to her question, though, a similar question came in. This one's from Kevin. He says, hey, guys, love the show. Grew up watching MASH with my dad. He would get mad sometimes because he was laughing so hard he'd miss the next joke. I'd find myself rewinding here and there to make sure I hear all the jokes, something my dad could have used back in the day. My question for Jeff concerns the continuity of scenes between the exterior scenes filmed at the ranch versus the interior scenes filmed at the studio. For example, an exterior shot of Hawkeye and BJ leaving the swamp and walking across the compound to the mess tent. As they enter, they cut to the interior shot of them coming into the mess tent. I presume this was shot on a different day. The detail to the continuity in the actor's wardrobe between the interior and exterior shots is done extremely well, I guess like everything else on the show. My question, Jeff, is do you recall any stories about this issue? There must have been painstaking efforts to match everything in the wardrobe from the exterior to the interior and vice versa, not to mention the actor's job and continuity as well. Sorry for the long-winded question, but curious if Jeff recalls doing a scene at the ranch and then having to continue the scene at the studio or vice versa. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Kevin. So there's two similar questions there. You know, mm-hmm. the detail of the costumes and the continuity, the acting, yeah. that challenge, and then also just the scheduling, as, as Robin said. So can you address any or all of that? Whew. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go get a sandwich. I'll talk to you in yeah. a bit while you, while okay. you answer all that, okay? Yeah. Well, uh, first, gee, Robin, thanks for that voicemail. And uh, certainly we all uh, wish you well yes. uh, with your situation. And it's very tough to deal with that uh, condition. And again, we send you good love and best wishes with it. It's difficult. So with regard to kind of both situations, that uh, the questions are very similar. Every episode, there would be one day during the week that was out at the ranch. So if there was a scene where people walked across the compound and then walked into the swamp, them walking into the swamp from the swamp's point of view would have been shot on the stage the next day. So the scheduling is done so that they know that when somebody walks across the compound and goes into the swamp door, they know that the next day or the two days later, whatever they schedule it for, that scene is going to be shot so that the actors can pick up the dialogue coming into the swamp on the stage. So that's kind of the way it works on everything. And if somebody was walking out of the swamp and then is actually out at the ranch, the same thing in reverse would have happened. We would have shot them walking out of the uh, swamp on the stage and then walking out on the compound out at the ranch. <laughs> so there would be a there would be two days to shoot those kinds of situations. Uh, so every the the interesting thing is though that at some point the trips out at the ranch were kind of discontinued and so they didn't go out there as much. Hmm. And so there was a lot um, better continuity in terms of using the stage itself to kind of meander around and wander around the camp. But when they did go out to the ranch Uh, Yes, they would have to shoot those kinds of scenes on different days, if that makes any sense whatsoever. No, it does. And and the question about continuity with like costumes and things like Mm -hmm. that, is that the role of the assistant director? Who is in charge of making sure that they look the same, whether they're walking out at the ranch or on stage nine? Usually that's the uh, script supervisor is really sort of observing that and trying to kind of corral that and make sure that nobody's, you know, wearing (laughs) wrong shirt or something when they're doing it. Okay. Also, a wardrobe person might be on the set and go, wait a minute. No, no, you got to wear the blue shirt. And actors have their own way of sort of recording what it is they're supposed to be doing properly. But basically, it's the responsibility of the script supervisor to keep all that continuity in as precise a way as possible. Gotcha. And that script supervisor, there was one Marty Lohenheim. Marty was a script supervisor for a while. And then later on, uh, Carmine Scalza's wife. (laughs) <laughs> was the script supervisor. Boy, Carmine just keeps <laughs> popping up here, doesn't yeah, he? Yeah, he's all over the place. <laughs> well, one more question. It also has to do with scheduling. This one from Michael saying, Jeff, as a recurring actor who appeared on about half of the episodes, did you know well ahead of time what days you would be needed on set? Were you able to schedule other work during the shooting season? Yes, I was able to uh, keep my job at Walmart and do the MASH <laughs> episode. So... <laughs> It was easy. 
you know, when you're a greeter, uh, right. people respect you. You have that vest. You're yeah. doing well. A lot of responsibility. And then you go, okay, I got to go to 20th Century Fox. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and this is, I mean, no harm to greeters at Walmart. I'm kind of having fun with this. But <laughs> yes, uh, you would know what days you'd be needed because your agent would be called and they'd say, hey, we got to have them Thursday and Friday next week and blah, 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 blah. And then a script would be sent to you. So yeah, you had pre-knowledge uh, of what days you're going to be needed on that set. Like a week's notice or did you know more than that? Uh, sometimes. Sometimes it was a week. Sometimes, okay. you know, four days. Pretty much, you know, it was there was never a surprise, really. You always knew that you're going to be working on a particular day within the next week or so. All right. Well, that must have been very comforting to your employers at Walmart, too. <laughs> yes. It did. There were, yeah, fewer conflicts that way. <laughs> exactly. I'm yeah. sorry, Walmart. I got to go to the <laughs> fan the mash thing. Okay. They were very nice. They were both very understanding of each other, Fox and Walmart. <laughs> they worked well together. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, that does it for this episode of Mash Matters again. Oh no, not Rhea. Don't we have so much more? Don't we? Don't we have more answers to give? Oh, we do. Oh, well, we have a lot okay. of questions. I don't know if we have the answers, but we have lots of questions to get to, <laughs> okay. and we will get to more of those questions, and you can keep sending them in. We're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. You can also go to our website, mashmatters.com. You can email us, mashmatterspodcast at gmail.com. Listen to us wherever. We're on YouTube and your favorite podcast player, and you can also call and leave a voicemail under three minutes in length, and that number is 513-436-407. I have an idea, a suggestion for an episode. Why don't we do one where we just give answers and let our listeners figure out some questions? Oh, interesting. Ah, Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we still have to come up with answers, though. So, you know, oh. even if we're giving answers to questions that don't exist, I still feel like we wouldn't give the right answer. Now I'm really mixed up. I'm not sure what we're supposed to do. I'm... <laughs> I don't, do I still work here? I'm not sure. Yes, I? and Walmart. Yeah. <laughs> All right, until next time, here's looking up your old address. 